We want to begin a, uh, a new Bible study tonight. A few weeks ago, we finished studying the book of Romans. We said that the, uh, the book of Romans was the first uh, doctrinal letter in, in the New Testament after the book of Acts. And it's the most complete doctrinal letter. Paul wrote that to a church that he didn't know most of the people there. Uh, he wrote it to strangers. He knew some of the folks who were there, because we know from the end of that he was mentioning some of the folks that he knew. But he wanted to be sure that they, they had a, uh, they had a uh, understanding of God's word. And we said it was a very complete doctrinal letter. It was covered, and we, he established the foundation of faith because the key scripture in that is the just shall live by faith tonight I want to begin the study of a short, much shorter book and a much more pointed book the book of Galatians I'm going to call this series of messages just a few, not going to be as long as the book of Romans the gospel of grace crucified with Christ and uh, just like the book of Romans John if you go to the very next slide the the key scripture is, the just shall live by faith. You know, there are those who see a difference between Old Testament uh, salvation and New Testament salvation. And there's really no difference. We, we said this when we were going through the, the, uh, the book of Romans, that when, when Paul wanted to teach about salvation, the example he used was Abraham. And Abraham was there before the law was given. There are some folks that think that, you know, you have to have the law to be saved. But we're going to find out tonight that the law couldn't save him in the Old Testament. It sure can't save us now. We're saved by faith, grace. And that was just as true in the Old Testament as it is now. They, had, they did not have the revelation that we have. They did not have the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Jesus Christ. But when they brought their offerings, after, after the law was given, when they brought their offerings and sacrifices, even Cain and Abel, that far back, when they brought their sacrifices, they had to be brought with faith. Just bringing a sacrifice, just going through the motions or going through the ritual, could not, couldn't do it. It looked good on the outside, but... Salvation has to do with who we are on the inside. We know that Abel brought a better sacrifice. Why? Because he did so in faith. So faith and the grace and mercy of God have been there since, really, when, since he had to cover Adam and Eve with bloody skins to cover their sin. That was the mercy of God, the grace of God. He took a life of an innocent victim so that they could be covered, covered with blood. Well, when Paul wrote his letter to the churches of Galatia, he wrote it to churches that, that he had planted. There's a little map up there, and again, if you, if you read through the book of Acts, chapters 13 and 14, talk about Paul's first missionary journey. And we're going to see what preceded that, okay, uh, we're going to read tonight a little bit. But Paul and his friend Barnabas who was, you know, the son of consolation, Barnabas. He was, they went on a missionary journey. They took Mark with them, but Mark didn't last too long. Uh, he kind of bailed out on them, and we don't know. We're not sure why. We know that Paul didn't want to take him the second time. <laughs> he said, no, oh, man, he bailed out on me. But uh, we see by looking at this map, names of cities. Now, if you would look at a, a map of, of modern, the modern Middle East, that would be Turkey that you're looking at right there. Uh, Israel would be like down here and and we can see Antioch in the bottom lower right hand corner Antioch that had become that was becoming like the center of the church initially it was Jerusalem but after after several years um, the with the, with the advent of the Gentile believers the and, and the, the the heavy persecution in Jerusalem by the by the Jewish uh, the Jews against the Jewish Christians the center of the church began to move north and began to have, have more of a Gentile uh, flavor to it. Well, there, there's Antioch, and then uh, if you look up a little further, there's Tarsus, 
Uh, that's where Paul w grew up. That's where he was born. When he was, he was born to Jewish parents, they gave him a Jewish name, Saul, which, by the way, uh, he was of a tribe of Benjamin. The first king of Israel was a Benjamite named Saul. That's that maybe another message. But, um, but he was born there and he was raised there. He was also a Roman citizen. So he had the Latin name Paul or Paulus. Uh, but that's where he was born. But in that yellow area there is a place where the, the first missionary journey, they went to Cyprus first, which is that island there. And then they went north and they went to Derby and Iconium and Lystra, Antioch and Pisidia and so forth. That's the, the territory that they covered on their first missionary journey, Acts chapters 13 and 14. And when they went there, that was an area, by the way, and interesting, I didn't know this, but I was reading, studying this, that the, the people that lived in Galatia were actually related... Um, genetically to like to the Gauls, France and England and so forth. There was a connection there, a genetic connection. But anyway, you know, they, they migrated. and uh, Sons of Japheth, that's, you know, Ham, Jeff, and again, that's another message too. But uh, Paul went there, and he, and, he, and he planted churches. He went there. They, they, were, they were heathens. They worshipped uh, idols. Uh, there was one place in, I believe it was in Lystra, where Paul and Barnabas went there and, and they healed a guy. And the people there in that city thought that they were Jupiter and Mercury. They were going to, like, make offerings and sacrifices to him. And Paul said, no, don't do it, you know, because we're not, we're not gods. And they eventually threw him out. <laughs> they threw him out of town. But that's where Paul was stoned to death. And came back to life. Uh, that's where he was, you know, they left him for dead and so forth. But anyway, that's where he met Timothy in that area. He uh, befriended Timothy. But that's the churches uh, in Galatia. And to understand why he wrote the letter to the Galatian churches, uh, which is one of his maybe earliest letters, I believe one of his earliest letters, uh, to understand that fully, we need to turn to the book of Acts and read a chapter there. Uh, Acts chapter 15. Now, chapters 13 and chapters 14 were about their, their trip into Galatia. But listen to what was going on there. <clears throat> and they, they were stationed, they were based in Antioch. When they finished their first missionary journey, they went to Antioch. And, the, and God was pouring out the gospel to the Gentiles. The you know, Gentiles were getting saved. This, this gospel of grace. How many people know who was the first one to preach to a Gentile was Peter. When he was sent to the home of Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and uh, God poured his spirit out, and uh, Peter, you know, would never have walked into the home of a Gentile because he was a good, good Jew, you know. But God gave him the vision and so forth, and he said, listen, don't call anybody anything common that I have blessed and so forth. But uh, in chapter 15, let's read there a little bit. <clears throat> Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren. Now, this is, this is Luke writing this, and uh, they're in Antioch taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So what was happening is all these Gentiles were getting saved, hearing the gospel, putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and change them and do this work in their life. And all of a sudden, here come these, you know, the pointy hats from Jerusalem, and they're saying, hey, wait a minute. No. I mean, that's good. You accepted Jesus. That's great. But you have to be circumcised. Well, Where'd that come from? We, in, we know in the Old Testament, God gave circumcision as a sign, and Paul writes a lot about that, and as we go on in Galatians, we're going to read about that. But, you know, he gave that as a sign of the covenant between him and the descendants of Abraham, who would become the Israelites eventually. But these ones, they figured, hey, you had to be, if, you're going to, if God's going to accept you, remember we called our uh, messages from Romans accepted by God. If, it, if God's going to accept you, you have to do it according to are, you know, what we have here, this thing. So uh, they said, you got to be, you got to, you, if, if you can't be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And therefore, Paul and Barnabas, had, but Paul said, hey, wait a minute. He had no small dissension and disputation with them. Oh, a little bit of dis disputation going on with some false teachers coming in. To, okay, Paul said, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Well, we're going to see we're, we're the first church council in the history of the church to determine an issue. Okay? And being brought on their way, 
in verse 3, by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring their conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto the brethren. Hey, praise the Lord. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up a certain sect of the Pharisees which believed. These were Jewish Christians. These were believers in Jesus. And they said that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Hey, we've got to be circumcised and we've got to send them to Torah school. I was in, I was, I was in a, a gathering of people not too long ago and a guy said, you, you need the Old Testament. Kids. I thought to myself, you know, when I got saved... I didn't know anything about the Old Testament. I knew about Davy and Goliath. I knew about Noah. I knew about that stuff. But I didn't know anything. When I got saved, I was home, I was home in my living room all by myself. And, and God slew me in the spirit. I got slain in the spirit. Nobody laid hands on me. I, I wasn't trying to impress anybody. I wasn't trying to fake it so they'd leave me alone. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't, none of that. I mean, it was like, boom, I went down. I said, Lord, I said, if you're real, I want to know it. And he said, okay. I said, all right. Okay, I got it. I got saved. I said, all right. And, and you know, I mean, there were people, you know, witnessing to me, and I've, I've given my testimony. I'm, I'm not going to give it again. But all I'm saying is, I don't know anything about the Old Testament. Was I not saved then? See, this is what Paul is dealing with and what he's going to deal with in Galatians. Listen, listen to what he says. It says back in verse 5, let's read it again. Certain of the sect of the Pharisees said, uh, which believed, Christians, saying this is, it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, and I'll bet you there was a whole lot of disputing going on there. Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear their, the word of the gospel. If you go back to chapter 10, you can read how Peter went to visit Cornelius, the Roman soldier, and God didn't even let him finish his message until he just went ahead and they all started speaking in time. Well, that was, Peter said, well, <laughs> we might as well baptize them. And they took him out, baptized him in water. It was, you know, they were saved, okay? He says, verse 8, and God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by what? By faith. They got saved. They didn't know about the Old Testament. They hadn't been to Torah school. They hadn't learned any of the 616 commandments given in, 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 in the, the law of God. They uh, maybe didn't even know the Ten Commandments. They were saved through faith in Christ. I'm sure he began to work in your life like he began to work in mine or yours when you got saved. Peter says, he says in verse 9, put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God? See, I, I don't... <laughs> Why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? The law couldn't save us. Why do we think it's going to save them? The folks that nailed Jesus to the cross, they were, they were so holy according to the law. They were professional law keepers. The Pharisees and the scribes. The Apostle Paul talked about when he was, he was a Pharisee, he said, man, he said, I had it, I had it down right. Nobody did it better than me. Peter says, if it couldn't save us, I mean, following that law was a yoke to us, why are we going to put it on them? Why do folks want to put that on us? Why do people, and we can, we can, we can draw this, and we can, you know, expand this, that we're not just talking about the Torah and the law, but there's, there's folks who want to throw all kinds of yokes on you. I mean, there's some of these fellows, they want to be treated like a king. People, I got to stay off of YouTube. I don't know. I got to stay with me. All right. Okay. 
Why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck? See, this is what Paul is going to be dealing with in Galatians. This is what was happening. But we believe, in verse 11, this is what Peter talking. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Peter says, we're not saved by keeping the law. The Old Testament Jews weren't saved by keeping the law. They couldn't be because they couldn't keep it all the way. Nobody can. Except Jesus. Because he, he is the law. All the multitude, he shut them up. All the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken to me. Now, James seemed to be in charge here for people who think that Peter was the first pope. Well, he sure wasn't here. Okay. Simon had declared, verse 14, Simon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That's a quotation from the, the prophet Amos. You know, in David's tabernacle, it was open to anybody. Anybody could worship in David's tabernacle. And he set a tent up. Remember, that Solomon built the temple. But David put a tent up for the, for the, for the ark and for the holy place. He says, and that the residue of men, this is James speaking, he's continuing speaking, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says the Lord who does all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is, James says, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Thank God. James said, we're not going to lay all this stuff on them. We're not going to lay all the details of every little jot and tittle of the law. That was for Christ fulfilled them all. And the, and the law hasn't passed away. Jesus said one jot or one tittle will not pass away. But he fulfilled them. He, he, he uh, satisfied the demands of the law by keeping it. Something that you or I couldn't do. We're going to read that as we go on. He says... My sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles return to God. Verse 20. But that we write unto them, they gave them four things. They abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. That's a little better than 616. And the thing is, these were not commands for salvation. This was not, well, you have to do this for God to accept you. But he said, for Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So what he's saying was, listen... If you do these four things, to not offend the Jews who are there. He was trying to get them to be wary. And Paul talked about this over in Corinthians. He said, you know what, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I won't eat meat. We talked about that back in Romans too. They asked the Gentiles to be sensitive to the, to the cultural uh, the stigma of being a Jew. So, they, so James wrote a letter and he sent it out. And he basically said all this stuff. He says, you, you don't have to be circumcised. He said, some people have come saying that we sent them. We didn't send them. They didn't come from us. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to go to Torah school. You don't have to learn all the, you know, the 616. If you're saved and Jesus Christ is dwelling inside of you, if you could do these things, that would be, you should do these things. Because if you're around Jews and, and you see them, you see them do, they see you do stuff like this, if you don't abstain from this stuff, you will offend them. And, you know, if you could be kind and gracious. This is what, that's what this is about. It's not commands, it's not ways to be saved. Okay? Now, that sets the scene. That's what's going on. And that's why Paul wrote this next letter that we're going to read, the book of Galatians, or the letter to the Galatians. So turn there with me, okay? I'd like to give, give a context so you understand, this is, this is historical stuff, and it's, it has a reason for being there, okay? Now, Galatians, let's turn there. Like most of these letters that Paul wrote, Paul was a very uh, systematic person. He was a very educated person. He knew, you know, I, I think it's really wonderful that God choose, chose Paul to be the minister to the Gentiles because Paul was an educated Pharisee. I mean, he knew the law. He wasn't ignorant of what the Old Testament said. He studied it. His whole life was based on it. He was a professional law keeper. 
When people would look at folks like Paul, they would say, there's a guy, if anybody's, if anybody's going to go into the kingdom, it's going to be him. Because, man, it's touching the law. He said, I was blameless. I was... Phew. He says, starting in verse 1, I'm just going to read tonight. Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. I didn't get called in the ministry by Peter, James, John. We know the story how Paul got called. Man, he didn't, he didn't get visited. You know, they didn't take like a vote on him. Do we want to make... They voted on the... If you remember right in the beginning of the book of Acts, they voted on the guy that was supposed to replace Judas. You remember that? They picked a guy, I think, named Matthias. How much do we know about Matthias? What did he do? I mean, he probably was a good guy, you know. But Paul, they didn't vote him in. Man, he met Jesus face to face. He had a face to face encounter with Jesus Christ. And Paul, he hated the Christians. He hated when he said, uh, he said, people of that way. When he testified in front of Agrippa, if, again, if you look in the, in the back of the book of Acts, he said, man, he says, I was on my way to Damascus, and I got knocked on my face. And I said, Lord, who are you? And he said, and, and Jesus said to him, Paul, why are you kicking against the pricks, or the, what they would use to make oxen go, you know how that is, when they would have an oxen drive a cart, they would have a stick with a point on it, and they, they didn't have cattle prods back then, so they, you know, with the batteries in them, so they had to stick them with sticks and make the, make the oxen go, and sometimes oxen would be stubborn and kick against it. That's the way all Paul was. See, I just wonder, when Paul saw the, the uh, martyrdom of Stephen, because when Stephen was put to death, the first Christian martyr, Paul, Saul, Paul, was, uh, he was right there, he was like the uh, uh, officiant there <laughs> when they stoned Stephen. And I wonder if he thought so when Stephen said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the... I wonder if Paul heard that and said, wow. And when he, when he heard Stephen say, Father, forgive him, they don't know what they're doing, I wonder if that just fired him up all the more. I mean, deep down inside, he had to know that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Jesus was the Messiah. So he had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, and Jesus called him to the ministry. He says, Paul, an apostle, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, a common greeting where he exalts the Father, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. In this, in this letter to Galatians, if you want to prove the Trinity, just read all through this, because we see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. These first two chapters, which are kind of personal and testimonial for Paul, the next two are doctrinal, the last two are, are uh, uh, practical. He says in verse 6, he doesn't mince any words. He doesn't waste any time saying, hey, man, I really miss you guys. Um, I hope you're doing well. Hey, I, I hear about so-and-so. Hey, God bless you. It's so good. He doesn't even waste time with that. Paul says this, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. I'm amazed. Just a few months ago, or however long it was, maybe several weeks, I told you about Jesus Christ, and you forsook all your idols, and you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you invited him into your heart, and God touched you, gave you the Holy Spirit, saved you, gave you a new life, and now you want to be law keepers? I'm amazed. I'm amazed that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Oh, there's lots of things that call itself a gospel. But there's really only, there's really only two. There's either you're saved by grace and faith or you've got to work on something. Now, there's a lot of things I've got to work on in my life. 
but not to be saved. My, sa my salvation is through faith in Christ. See, people say, people say well, you know, uh, uh, that grace thing, it could cause you to sin. You show me somebody that, ca that calls himself a Christian, and they look for a loophole to sin, and I'll, tell you, I'll show you somebody that's not a Christian. Plain and simple. Now, he says, There's, this, this, it's not another gospel. It's a fake gospel. And it's really, you know, I, I, gave, I told you about the grace of God. I told you about the mercy of God. And now you want to follow after these people that want to make you, you know, wear yarmulkes and, and uh, celebrate the Passover. He says in verse 8, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have Preached unto you, let him be accursed. Man, that's, that's some heavy words. And it wasn't like Paul was trying to curse people. He said, listen, anybody that would rob you of your faith, rob you of your crown, let him be accursed. Anathema. As we said before, so we say, say now again, he repeats himself. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, that you have, other than you have received, let him be accursed. If I come and give you some, some kind of new thing, you can throw some rocks at me, he said. He says, for now do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? You think I'm in this because I want to make people happy? It's the wrong business. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. I didn't go to school to learn it. I mean, Paul went to school for a lot of years. He was raised in, in Tarsus, studied under this great uh, rabbi Gamaliel. He was educated, man. He had all the degrees. But he didn't learn the gospel there. He didn't learn, he didn't learn salvation there. I swear, some of these schools, guys go into them, and they, and they, and they, they learn how not to be saved. They'll rob them. He says, it, it, It's not after man, verse 12, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, I'm glad I can say that. I'm, I mean, if folks witnessed to me, and I know a lot of you have the same testimony. People witnessed to me, told me the gospel I heard. I read tracts. I read all that stuff, heard preachers. Yeah, okay. But when it comes right down to it, your salvation is based on a face-to-face, one-on-one with Jesus Christ. You might not meet him. You might not see him on the road to Damascus. But I'm going to tell you, you had a road to Damascus somewhere, if you're saved. You had, you had some experience in your life where you came to the end and you got confronted with who you are and who you aren't. And you had a face-to-face -face with Jesus Christ. You didn't have to learn all the Old Testament. You didn't have to, all you had to learn was this, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away my sin. That's it. That's the beginning. Oh, well, there's a lot to learn. There's sanctification, all that stuff. But salvation is, is, is face to face. Paul said, listen, I learned this gospel face to face. I, I came face to face with Christ. He says, verse 13, For you have heard of my conversation or my lifestyle in time past in the Jews' religion. <laughs> he calls it Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Paul says, man, I was, I was notorious for being righteous according to the law. He even says that in Philippians. And I, I might not have got it on the screen. I apologize. But turn over to Philippians chapter 3 for one minute. And you don't have to dig it up, John. It's just real quick. I'll just... Uh, in, it's uh, G, Galatians, Ephesians... Philippians, okay. Look, look at chapter 3. He says this in verse 4. And in, just taking this a little out of context, he says, Though I might have also uh, confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. Listen to what Paul has to say himself. Say about himself. Circumcised the eighth day, that's good, of the stock of Israel, not another requirement, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, good credentials, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, man, they respected the Pharisees, 
concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul says, I kept them all, at least to the best of my ability. I tried. I was really zealous. Man, I, was re I really kept that thing. But he says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness. He goes on and says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his. That's who Paul was. That's what he gave up when he got saved. So he knew what he was talking about when he was talking about the law. He says, and he gives his history here, his little testimony. It says in verse 15, But when it pleased God, this is back to Galatians chapter 1, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. When Paul got saved, he didn't go to, he didn't go to Bible school. He didn't go back to Jerusalem and talk with all the... He says, I didn't go to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. Man, he went out into the wilderness for a little while. Desert. How many people here learned about God in the wilderness? I'll tell you one thing. You'll, you'll learn a whole lot more about God in the wilderness than you were on the mountaintop. <laughs> you'll learn more, a whole lot more about him when you're all by yourself in the middle of nowhere than when you're sitting like, you know, on the deacon's chair. Ours are downstairs. <laughs> but... We can't sit on them anyhow. We don't have any room for them. Okay. And he, and he recounts his, his time after he got saved. He says, uh, he, he went to Damascus again, verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Now, three years later of his salvation, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came unto the regions of Syria and Cilicia, uh, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. So he had not even been to Jerusalem for any large amount of time. He didn't see anybody except Peter and, uh, and, and James. But when they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the faith which he once destroyed, they glorified God in me. Okay, so now, then 14 years later, Paul didn't just jump into ministry. He was, he, he, it, it, another place he said he went back to Tarsus for a while and then came back and he spent time there and he was in Antioch with Barnabas and he was there and it was from there that they laid hands on him and sent him out into the mission field. But it didn't, it wasn't like, you know, three weeks later. That's what we want to do. Somebody gets saved and it's like, man, you know, three weeks later, man, hey, you want to go to Africa? <laughs> okay. I hate it whenever I hear a celebrity get saved. You ever you hear that? A celebrity? So, so they say, oh, so-and-so received Christ. You know, the next thing you know, they'll, everybody want to get them on TV. You know, what, what they ought to do, if somebody's a celebrity and they get saved, they ought to take some of their money and go on some island somewhere where nobody knows where they're at for about... Yeah. Okay, look at, verse, look at chapter 2. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now, this is, this is tying in with what we read in Acts chapter 15. This is after his first missionary journey. This was when all that stuff was happening. So we we're putting this in a time frame, okay? And I went up by revelation and communicated with them the gospel which I preach unto the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. He had this guy Titus with him, who later went on to be a, like a bishop in the church. He didn't make him get circumcised. He wasn't, he wasn't a Jew. He did make Timothy get circumcised only because he wanted Timothy to be able to go into the synagogue. Timothy was a Jew. He was born, he had a, a Jewish mother and grandmother. And he wasn't circumcised as a child because his dad was obviously a Roman. Paul said, listen, if you want to minister with me, you're Jewish. You have to be circumcised to go into the synagogue. He didn't do it because he had to to get saved, okay? But here's Titus. He said, I didn't make him get circumcised. And it says, 
And that because of false brethren unawares, verse 4, brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Law-keeping is bondage. Thinking that God is going to accept you because you've, you've been a good person. Uh, it, that's bondage. You, you're, always under this, you're always under this yoke. Because, you know, I can, I can maybe go all day and not break God's law, but I guarantee you, it's not far. There's 616 of them. And even if, you, even if you take out the ones that are ceremonial because there's no temple, so we can't bring offerings and sacrifices, even, even if you take them out, Jesus took the, 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 some of the commandments and he took them from being outward and made them inward. We all know that. When he had the Sermon on the Mount, he said, man, if you heard say don't commit adultery, well, if you're just thinking about it, men, women don't think like that. <laughs> Men, if you, just, if you just think about it, if you just, you know, turn over in your head for a couple minutes, that's adultery. In God's eyes, it's a sin. It's not the outward thing, it's the inward thing. And women got their share, too. The fact is, none of us are righteous. We, we, we read in Romans, nobody's righteous, nobody, no one, nobody can keep it. It's a bondage. And you're always under this you're either deceiving yourself, telling yourself, hey, I'm doing pretty good. Or you're always under this sword that's hanging over your head. Oh, God. I don't want to live like that. I, <laughs> I want to have confidence in what Jesus did on the cross. Oh, I, hey, listen, I want to be holy. I want God to make, I want him to take that stuff out of me. I want him to make me a new creature. I want him to make me look more like Jesus every day. But I don't want to have to live under that thing. I'm, I, I've been given the spirit of adoption where I can cry, Daddy. I don't have to worry about him getting ready to smack me. Okay. I'm getting off the track. All right. He says, back in verse 4, that because of false brethren unawares brought in that came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. I, I, pray, I pray God would help me not keep my mouth shut when I need to open it. But if these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he was wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Paul was saying Peter was sent to the Jew, even though he was the first one to go to the Gentiles, he was basically sent to the Jews, and I was sent to the Gentiles. He says, and when they saw this, and you know what, Paul was not impressed, and, and this is what I love about the apostle Paul, he he was not impressed with, like, the ones who were supposed to be, like, big shots, you know? <laughs> I always said, I, I respect authority, but I'm not impressed by it. I'm just, this is me. He says in verse 9, And when James, Cephas, who is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and unto the circumcision. Again, that's the Acts chapter 15. They got the blessings. They got the letter from James. They could go forth saying, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to follow the Torah. Just do these things for the sake of the Jews that we're going to be ministering to. Only that we should remember the poor the same which I also was forward to do. Okay, verse 10. So now, they, you know, here's Paul. Now he's giving his testimony. Here's Paul. Uh, they, they had, he met Jesus, got saved, did the missionary journey, uh, got the letter from James and from the folks in Jerusalem saying, you don't have to be circumcised, right? Everything's all hunky-dory. Peter's going to the Jews. Paul's going to the Gentiles. Gospel's going forth. But he relates an incident to us. And I'm kind of glad to see things like this because I'm glad that these guys were human. But when Peter was come to Antioch, remember we showed it on the map there, Antioch? When Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood in, Paul got, he said, I got in his face. Got in his face. Because he was to be blamed. Well, what happened, Paul? Let, 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 me, just, let me just relate it, paraphrase it. When, when, when Peter, when, when Paul was in Antioch, Peter came up with some of the guys from down Jerusalem. 
some of the Jewish guys, the Jewish Christians, okay? And they came up, and they, and they went into a house with, with, where the Gentile Christians were. They were going to have, they were going to have a dinner, maybe a love feast. You know, they would have love feasts, and they would, the church would come together, and they would break bread. And, and what happened was that, the, you know, here, like the Gentiles were sitting over here in this room, and Peter comes in and says, hi guys, excuse me, but uh, I'm, I'm with my, my boys from Jerusalem here. And he went into the other room, and Paul said, hey, wait a minute. But now all of a sudden, you're too good to sit with Gentiles. Remember, Peter got that vision? <laughs> Peter was the first one to go into a Gentile house and preach the gospel? But what happened after a few years, man, Peter got a little... Maybe he was spending too much time with the boys back in Jerusalem. Paul had to straighten them out. He says... Look at verse 17, just dropping down a little bit. If, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If I go back, see what happened in that first or second century. A lot of the Jewish Christians, they went back. Especially before the temple was destroyed. They went back. That's what the next book I think we're going to study is, is, is the letter to the Hebrews. Because it's the same thing. The just shall live by faith. And he's dealing with this. They went back. They, they said, we just can't take the fact that these Gentiles are coming in here. And they're able to, you know, enjoy salvation without being like us. And we're so used to doing all this, you know, all the mosaic stuff. that We're, we're just going. So they went back to, to the old Jew, uh, Jew, Jewish system. It says, if I go back, I'm saying that the cross of Christ isn't enough. I make myself a transgressor. Think about losing your salvation. Listen. And here we, here we go to it. And probably, if you remember, any scripture from this. He says, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Verse 20. And here it is. If, if you forget everything else I said, take the scripture and commit it to your memory. For I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm dead with him. I'm dead to the law because he fulfilled the law. I'm dead with him. My body's crucified. Nevertheless, I'm alive. Yet not I, but what? Christ lives in me. The same one who fulfilled and satisfied all the demands of the law, all 616 commandments uh, of the spirit of the law, the letter of the law, is all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. He's in me. And we find out later, he's in me by the spirit of God. The Holy spirit, We've been given the spirit of adoption, Paul said in Romans, whereby we could cry, Daddy, not the spirit of fear. Man, law brings fear. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live how? As a law keeper? No. He tried that. It didn't work. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The mercy of God, the love of God, the grace of God. Love covers a multitude of sins. His grace and his mercy saved me when I was incapable of saving myself. And that was true in the Old Testament. They looked for it. They believed God. They didn't know about the cross. They didn't know about the crucifixion. But they knew about the promise of God. They were saved by faith from Adam until the cross. And we're saved by faith just like they were. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. <laughs> you want to go ahead, you want to go learn that, learn, go learn a Torah. Go get you a, no. <laughs> you know. 
I'm not a Jew. I don't want to be a Jew. I like Jewish things. I like Hebrew things. I like the show for I love them. I love, I love learning about Hebrew stuff. But I'm not going to try to be a Jew. I'm not. I'm saved by grace. And you know what? They are too. If anybody's saved, it's by grace. <laughs> it's not by keeping the Torah. I can't. I said it before, I can't get past the first three or four. I'm crucified with Christ. If you're born again, you can know this and you can say this. And we're gonna, as we get into the next chapter, we're going to get into the doctrinal part where Paul, again, establishes how we're saved and why we're saved. What was done. We've been covered, man. I, I, I got covered with a bloody skin. My nakedness was covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's, you know, there's nothing I can add to that. I can't make it any better. I can't make myself any more acceptable to God than I am right now. Because Jesus paid it all. Amen? Any questions or comments before we close tonight?